Good morning. I echo my thanks to Mr. Genuis for your talk to us this morning, your encouragement, and I'm so glad you mentioned superheroes because I'm waiting to see the new Avengers movie. Anybody seen it? No? We live in a superhero generation, don't we? There you go. <laughs> superheroes are everywhere. In fact, there's been an incredible rise of the superhero genre over the last 10 years. The Avengers movie that's out now is the first film to gross more than one, or the fastest film to gross more than $1 billion worldwide. I think it was 11 days it took to make a billion dollars. And we're seeing a resurgence of these popularity in superhero movies. Why is that? Why are we so fascinated and engrossed by this kind of a story? The New York Film Academy cites the economic crash of 2008 as one of the main reasons. In fact, they draw a parallel with the financial downturn 10 years ago with the thousands of people who lost their jobs and homes and savings as a parallel with the economic disaster of the 1930s which also saw the first rise in popularity of the comic book. The birth of the stories that today we're making into popular movies. Why is that? Well, maybe people were looking for an escape from hard times. A world where good triumphs over evil. A hero to believe in. Or even something to have faith in. That's what the superhero movie provides. But all the heroes are not perfect, are they? Some of them are quite flawed, in fact, and even quite immature. Think of Spider-Man, for example, one of my favorites. Spider-Man is cool because Peter Parker is just a kid, isn't he? He's just a kid who got bit by a spider, and all of a sudden, he's a superhero. He has no idea of what to do, how to do it, how to make the web come out and all the, climb up the buildings, and he's falling down, and he just has to learn. In fact, he needs the counsel of the master superheroes like Iron Man, and he needs the counsel of his guardians, his Aunt May and Uncle Ben. And what was that good piece of advice that Uncle Ben gave to Peter Parker in that first Spider-Man movie? With great power comes great... See, you have seen the movie. I knew it. <laughs> I knew it. <laughs> but that's more than just a line to sell movie tickets. That has a nugget of truth for us in our day-to-day -day lives, too. And as we continue along in this uh, study of faith, this series called The Mustard Seed Life, we're going to dive today into what I might call the challenge of faith. See, as Christians, we're not baby superheroes, but we are learning. We're learners, just like the first disciples were learners, disciples of Jesus. And this morning, I want to present to you the idea that faith, brings us into a discipleship relationship with Jesus and with it into a series of responsibilities that we can only, it turns out, carry out by faith. You see what I mean? Faith brings us into a discipleship relationship with Jesus that includes a series of responsibilities that we can only carry out by faith in him. So turn with me, if you will, to Luke chapter 17. Gospel of Luke, 17th chapter. I want to read for you from verses 1 to 10. Luke chapter 17, beginning to read at verse 1. This is God's word. And he said to his disciples, that's Jesus, temptations to sin are sure to come, but woe to the one through whom they come. It would be better for him if a millstone were hung around his neck and he were cast into the sea than that he should cause one of these little ones to sin. Pay attention to yourselves. If your brother sins, rebuke him. And if he repents, forgive him. If he sins against you seven times in the day and turns to you seven times saying, I repent, you must forgive him. The apostles said to the Lord, Increase our faith. And the Lord said, If you had faith like a grain of mustard seed, you could say to this mulberry tree, Be uprooted and planted in the sea, and it would obey you. Will any one of you who has a servant plowing or keeping sheep say to him when he has come in from the field, Come at once and recline at the table? 
Will he not rather say to him, prepare supper for me and dress properly and serve me while I eat and drink, and afterward you will eat and drink? Does he thank the servant because he did what was commanded? So you also, when you have done all that you were commanded, say, we are unworthy servants. We have only done what was our duty. In this passage of Scripture, Jesus is teaching his disciples. He's in teaching mode. And faith is at the center of the lesson. The passage is hinged by the middle verse, verse 5, which is the explanation of the disciples and request for faith. They're crying out to him. On either side is Jesus teaching. Two lessons on the front side and two lessons on the back. The first two lessons are what lead the disciples to ask for faith, and the second two lessons are how Jesus responds to their request. So the structure is a request for faith in the middle with the teachings surrounding that request. We're going to unpack this morning that lesson that Jesus was trying to teach, those four lessons, and the first lesson is simply this. People of faith are responsible to teach sound doctrine and model sound doctrine living. People of faith are responsible to teach sound doctrine and model sound living. Why is this the case? Well, first of all, we've already seen that Jesus is teaching his disciples here. Remember, the opening transition to the chapter, he said to his disciples, this changes the focus from the previous chapter where Jesus was speaking to the Pharisees, and he focuses in now on his disciples in a teaching moment. The idea now is instruction rather than the condemnation of the hypocrisy of the, of the Pharisees. But the instruction is not exactly bright and sunny. The first thing he tells them is that following him is not going to be easy. Temptation to sin is sure to come. So in that limited sense... Is that what the disciples were asking for faith to overcome? Surely it takes great faith to oppose temptation. But Jesus actually goes further here. Because he says, woe to the one through whom temptation comes. And then he uses some very stark imagery. Better a millstone would be hung around his neck, that heavy, heavy stone, and him cast into the sea than he should cause someone to sin. Jesus is warning the disciples here. He's warning them, yes, the believer will have to face temptation. That is for sure. But you better not be the one to cause them to fall. This is a warning to the disciples in the most graphic terms to be sure that they are not the cause of stumbling another's walk. And the weight of responsibility is all of a sudden clear to them. See, Jesus was concerned with false teachers. He mentioned them on several occasions. Matthew chapter 7 and verse 15, Jesus says this, Watch out for false prophets. They come in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ferocious wolves. Matthew chapter 24 and verse 24, he says again, False messiahs and false prophets will appear and perform great signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the elect. Here in Luke 17, he's saying that false teaching better not come from you. How could this be possible? Let me show you real quick three things that the Bible says about false teaching that I think make this possible. First, the harmony of Scripture is that the apostles were conscious to guard against it, against false teaching. Peter writes in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 16, We did not follow cleverly devised stories when we told you about the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ in power, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. See, Peter was careful not to use his own ingenuity when preaching the gospel, but to rely on the facts and the truth about Jesus. So Peter was aware of the danger. So was Paul. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 2. Paul says, we have renounced disgraceful and underhanded ways. We refuse to practice cunning or to tamper with God's word, but by the open statement of the truth, we would commend ourselves to everyone's conscience in the sight of God. So Paul, too, is careful not to distort the word of God lest he lead anyone astray. The harmony of Scripture is that the apostles were conscious to guard against false teaching in their own ministry. 
Number two, the harmony of scriptures is that the disciples knew false teaching could come from within. Look at the testimony of Peter in 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 1. But there were also false prophets among the people, just as there will be false teachers among you. He's talking to the church. The danger is within. So clearly Jesus is justified in his preemptive warning to the disciples so much earlier on in their journey when they were just learning. Paul has the same story in Acts chapter 20, verse 30. Even from your own number, men will arise and distort the truth in order to draw away disciples after them. The harmony of Scripture is that the disciples knew false teaching could come from within. How did they know that? They knew it from the teaching of the Master all those years before. Thirdly, the harmony of Scripture is that punishment for false teaching is severe. Punishment is severe. The whole of 2 Peter 2 is devoted to a description of the horrendousness of false teachers. And the apostle says they bring swift destruction on themselves. He says their condemnation has long been hanging over them. Where did he get that? He got that from Jesus who taught it. Jesus is teaching his young disciples that you who are following the way, who have taken up as disciples of Jesus, you bear a serious responsibility to preserve faithful teaching. You are models by what you say and what you do. And you, if you lead others astray, the penalty is harsh. Now, what does that mean for us today? There's a lot of things that I can think of. One is the importance of taking responsibility for our children's education. For the Christian, this is not an option. It's a responsibility. We must actively be engaged in ensuring that our children are not led astray or that we don't lead them astray by entrusting them their moral, intellectual, and spiritual development to someone who will deceive them. Now, I know that doesn't mean sequestering them away from the world. It doesn't have to be private Christian schools or homeschooling. Those things are good. What it does mean is taking whatever steps are necessary to ensure that they are being taught what God, who God is, and what he wants, and not being distorted in their view of God by someone who's leading them away from God. Another application is the Christian is responsible not to be silent in the face of attacks against God, whether that's the home or the office, or the school, or the public square. Our honorable guest is an example of that. Standing up for Christians being systematically persecuted at home and abroad. Not willing to allow subtle values tests to marginalize people of faith from receiving their access to government programs like the Canada Summer Jobs. The Christian heeding the call to discipleship from Jesus in Luke 17, recognizes this, that he or she cannot be silent in the, face of, in the face of attacks against their faith. Why? Because they may cause people to stumble who are watching them. People are watching you, knowing you are a Christian, if they know you're a Christian, which they should, when you say nothing and the word of God is mocked or opposed, they could be discouraged, even dissuaded in their own spiritual journey because of your lack of exercising your faith. There's a serious cost to allowing someone else to stumble. And I think that speaks to the importance of engaging in cultural and political issues. I think this speaks to the importance of not being a passive sideline Christian because the example we set as followers of Christ is being watched, being assessed, being compared against the truth of the doctrine that is coming out of our mouths. Jesus taught that followers of him have the responsibility of, sound, of teaching sound doctrine and living sound living because they must defend against ca causing others to stumble or worse yet, to fall into sin. That's the first lesson. And it only gets harder from here. The second lesson is that people of faith have the responsibility to respond appropriately to sin against them. 
Not only must we avoid leading others into sin with our words and behavior, but when someone sins against us, we must respond appropriately. And what is the appropriate response? Well, it's in verse 3. Jesus says, if your brother sins, rebuke him. And if he repents, forgive him. Notice that there are two parts to the response. Rebuke and forgive. I would argue that both require great faith. It's not always easy to confront someone, is it? Even when they've wronged you. Sometimes we lash out reflexively. Sometimes we might argue with them. But oftentimes, especially if it's happened, you know, it happened maybe in, not in our presence or it happened a little while ago, that can get bottled up inside of us. And I would say this might be a reason why sometimes forgiveness can be hard to give because we haven't taken the first step. We're just worried about trying to get our minds to the second step. How do I forgive this person? We haven't taken the first step of confront confrontation. Now, I know there are many situations where a sin is committed against someone in a position of subordination or vulnerability, and they can't confront the perpetrator. I know that sin done to a person, sin done to you, can leave lasting scars that take time and grace and healing and help to resolve. I'm not discounting that in the slightest. But here, Jesus is talking about sin amongst brothers. He's talking about relationships amongst peers and the things that come between those relationships to divide, to disrupt, or even destroy them. I'm sure you've seen that happen. Maybe you've seen that happen in the church, where sin between brothers and sisters disrupts to ruin friendships, marriages, families, even puts the church at risk. And Jesus says, if you want to follow me, if you want to be my disciple, you need to deal with sin against you properly. The interesting thing and the challenging thing is that he places the burden of responsibility heavily on the one sinned against rather than on the perpetrator. He lays the foundation of the biblical model for forgiveness and reconciliation that he further develops in Matthew 18. Matthew 18, remember where Jesus says, if your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault, rebuke, between you and him alone. If he listens to you, you've gained a brother. But if he does not listen, take one or two others with you, that every charge may be established by the evidence of two or three witnesses. If he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. If he refuses to listen even to the church, let him be to you as a Gentile or tax collector. There is a place for cutting off that communication. There's a way to deal with this problem. In Matthew 18, Jesus is talking about what happens if you, you keep running up against the dead end when you're trying to address the issue. In Luke 17, he's talking about the positive response. If the person turns in their heart and, re and repents, and if they do that, he's not instructing us to judge their heart or give them two or three or four other hoops to jump through. What does he say? You must forgive. In fact, even if the sincerity of their heart is in question, because they come back seven times in the same day and need forgiveness seven times because they committed the same thing against you multiple times. If they say that they are repenting, we must give the benefit of the doubt and forgive. Now, that seems, if that seems like a hard teaching to you, if that seems hard to, to live out in real life, you're not alone. Because this is the point where the disciples cried out and said, Lord, Give us faith. We need faith to be able to do this because this doesn't seem like it's going to be achievable for us. Increase our faith. So what does Jesus do? He goes, poof, here's faith for you. Boom, oh, I've got faith. No, he didn't do that. He actually teaches them two more lessons. And so he moves on to lesson number three. Lesson number three is this. People of faith have the responsibility to represent the power and name of Christ zealously. Could just as easily have said, people of faith have the responsibility to use their faith. So that's what he's teaching. If you look at verse 6, this is the famous mustard seed verse. The Lord said, if you had faith like a grain of mustard seed, you could say to this mulberry tree, be uprooted. The mulberry tree it was a tree that was known to have a vast and strong root system. Interesting in the, in the context of relationships, which he was just talking, that can be, can be very twisted and convoluted. 
the mustard, the, the, uh, the, the mulberry tree could be uprooted and planted in the sea with just a mustard seed of faith. A couple of things about this verse. First, he's not saying that the disciples have no faith at all. It's important to understand the use of hyperbole, exaggeration, in the teaching of the Bible, and in particular in the teaching of Jesus, because he uses it a lot. We don't have time to look at other passages for sure, but we do have time to mention John chapter 14, verse 28. You can write that down in comparison to Luke 17. Because this is where the disciples were upset because Jesus was telling them he's getting ready to leave. And they didn't want him to leave. And even though Jesus says, I promise to send the helper, the Holy Spirit, the disciples were disturbed. And what does he say to them? He says, if you loved me, you would have rejoiced. Now, he wasn't saying that they didn't love him. Of course they did, and he knew that. What he's saying is that they were not understanding what loving him actually meant. They were not exercising the full extent of love for him and what that was all about. They're missing the bigger picture. Now, this is not a new idea to us. We encounter this all the time with our children, don't we? They love us, they trust us, but their behavior does not always reflect that. Or have you even used this as a dart in your own grown-up relationship. Well, if you really loved me, you would have, what? Treated me differently. Gotten me a better birthday present. I haven't gotten Derek back for that yet, by the way, last week. (laughs) He always has the last word, though, so I can't really do that. (laughs) It's not a new idea to us. But here in Luke, it's the same idea. It's not that they had no faith at all. It's that they were not exercising their faith. The point of the mustard seed is not the volume of faith, but the presence of the right kind of faith placed in the right person, in the right object. Not the quantity, but the exercise of faith. If you would just use the little bit of faith that you do have, what great things you could do for the kingdom of God. Now, Jesus is not saying that you shouldn't grow in faith. In fact, Jesus himself uses the description, oh, ye of little faith, multiple times in the gospel to encourage getting more and stronger faith. But even in Matthew 17, where Jesus attributes to the disciples their inability to heal the demon-possessed boy to their little faith, He uses the mustard seed again to describe how a small faith is needed to do the mightiest act in the kingdom of God. In Matthew 17, it's move a mountain. Luke 17, it's uproot this huge tree. The point is, for the person of faith, for the disciple, our faith is not strong because we make it so. Our faith can move mountains or uproot mulberry trees because it's placed in Someone strong. It's Jesus who moves the mount. Jesus who uproots the tree, not me. Still, Jesus is teaching that great things can and should be accomplished for the kingdom. This is the responsibility of the believer to exercise faith in Christ and change the world for his glory. We can do it right along with our brother here by engaging in the problems that need fixing in the world. That's why Paul said this to the Ephesians. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Not the result of works, not your own effort, but for good works, for you to do great things for God, to the glory of Jesus Christ, who saved us by faith that we put in him. Which leads us to the final lesson. People of faith have the responsibility to live in a way so as not to stumble others. People of faith have the responsibility to respond to offenses in a way that God prescribes, People of faith have the responsibility to use their faith for great things in the kingdom, and people of faith have the responsibility to attribute all glory and honor to God alone. 
This passage ends with an interesting parable. It's a short parable, verses 7 to 10. But the, the main point of the parable, without unpacking all of it, the main point of the parable is that when the servant does what he's commanded to do, he's not worthy of special praise. He hasn't earned special favor when he's done his job, what the master told him to do. If you look at this parable by itself, it seems a little bit depressing. It might even feel dismissive and oppressive, not unlike the rest of these lessons. But if you look at it in light of the other lessons about faith that Jesus is teaching his disciples, we see that faith is not a work that earns our justification with God even though we're the ones having faith. We are still fully dependent upon him and owe everything to him. So if we have faith that places us into relationship with the living God, if we exercise that faith that uproots trees and moves mountains for him, we still have only done what he has allowed us to do. He's worked through us and we've done it all for him and to his glory. See, the disciples asked for more faith so that they could live up to the responsibilities Jesus was placing on them as followers of him, as if they would be able to accomplish it if only they were a little bit stronger, all the while not realizing that no matter what they do or how strong their faith or how many trees they cast into the sea or how many mountains they move, they still have done nothing themselves and owe everything to God. People of faith have the responsibility to give all glory to God alone. Where does all this leave us? We have four tough lessons, four challenges, four responsibilities that come along with following Jesus in a life of faith. Four responsibilities and one plea. Lord, increase our faith. My conclusion this morning is simple. And that's what is your plea this morning? What is your cry? What is causing you to call out to God, Lord, increase my faith? Is it a temptation? Is it a trial? Is it a weight of responsibility? Whatever your need today, whatever your struggle, whatever your burden, whatever your responsibility, if your faith is in Jesus, he has the resources to bring you through it. See, when the disciples said, we can't do it, what Jesus is telling them is, you don't need to do it. You don't need to do better. You don't need more faith. You already have me. Of course he wants you to grow in your faith. Of course he wants you to be stronger. He wants to strengthen you over the course of your Christian discipleship journey. He wants to mature you, and he will. But when you place your trust in him, even the tiniest bit of faith, he uses it to do the impossible. He already saved you from sin. That's a pretty tall order. He already regenerated your lost and broken and dying soul into a new creation, by his marvelous grace, just upon the simple expression of the most basic faith to believe that Jesus is Lord and rose from the dead to give you that life, that simple expression of repentance, turning away from sin, turning to Jesus and clinging to him. When you get to the point with the disciples and you want to say, Lord, help me cling Tighter, help me hold on tighter. The marvelous news for us is that Jesus is saying, don't worry, I'm holding on to you. The apostle John was one of those gathered there amongst the disciples when Jesus taught this lesson. He was one of those who asked the Lord to increase our faith, but he learned these four lessons from Jesus. And what did he turn, right, turn around and write in 1 John chapter 5 and verse 4? Listen to this. For everyone who has been born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world, 
our faith. Who is it that overcomes the world except the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? John can only be referring to the words of Jesus himself that he recorded in John chapter 16, where he tells the disciples, the Father himself loves you because you have loved me and believe that I came from God. In this world, you will have tribulation. Temptation is sure to come. But Jesus says, take heart, I have overcome the world. That's the promise of Jesus. And the challenge of faith becomes the promise of faith for all who believe. The little mustard seed deep in your heart that trusts Jesus with the little strength that you have is grown and nurtured and used by God to grow you into a victorious overcomer with Jesus. So what if you don't even have a mustard seed? What if you have yet to take that simple step of turning from self-reliance and placing your trust in Jesus who died to save you? You can do that. You can do that today. Believing he's the son of God who died in your place. Trusting him for the forgiveness of your sin. Becoming his disciple, a learner of the lessons of faith and overcoming with him to the glory of God the Father. Would you do that? Would you exercise even a mustard seed of faith? Jesus is waiting for you. And he's ready to do wondrous and wonderful things in your life if you put your faith in him. Let's pray. God of the universe, sovereign over all, yet Lord of each heart that trusts you and believes in your son, Jesus Christ. Thank you for the marvelous gift of salvation that you offer freely to all who will respond to your invitation. Thank you for calling us out of the darkness into your marvelous light. Thank you for the life that you give that is life abundant. May those who have not found you yet find it this morning by the power of your Holy Spirit and the wonder and magnitude of your grace for us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.